I'm going to ask, uh, in the typical fashion, a couple of questions, and then I'll hand over to the audience. So if you can be thinking of your questions, that would be great. Brian, Ryan, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the origins of this project for you. Uh, sure. I was, uh, sorry, thanks. <clears throat> uh, I was at home one morning, and my wife said to me, oh, this is an interesting story that she just read about in the paper. And, uh, and we just started looking into it, and then it seemed you know, that we could get hold of him and we could talk to him and I wrote to him and I spoke to Jenny who had researched the book, the original book that Hannes Rastam wrote and Jenny facilitated a visit so I went to say to her, well he was still locked up and so I went to see him with Jenny and uh, said we'd like to make a film about you and he said fine, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, there was a bit of a problem with the, uh, buying the rights to Hannes's book at first because they were being handled by an agency in Los Angeles, and uh, of course, Scandi Noir is very big, and, and there was talk of a big feature film, and, and somebody called Scorsese was mentioned, and, and, I, and I went to LA to see the people, uh, see this agency, and said, I want to buy the rights to this book, and they went, <laughs> you know, get in line, Sonny. And, uh, and, but then I, went to, I just went to see him, I thought, well, I don't need the book, it's a public story, so I went to see him with Jenny, and he said, fine, and then suddenly the rights became available. A shorter account than some, but that's that's great, Jenny. I was wondering if you could tell a little bit about what it's like to have your professional career so dominated by a single story such as this, and, and then culminating in this film, or maybe not culminating. <laughs> well, yes, uh, Thomas Quick or Stuart Burwell has has been in my life for a long time now, <laughs> um, uh, and I usually say that if I'm going on Jeopardy and the subject is Thomas Quick, I would win because I know everything about this person and uh, all of his crimes, his hideous stories throughout the years. Um, uh, I'm very proud of my work, um, and um, it's not just a journalistic product. Uh, we have also been through an appeal process, and he's now acquitted of all the murders. And yesterday, the government commission, commission review came with their report, 700 pages, and they just confirmed our work, so. Well, that, that, that sort of answers my next question of, of, for an update of him. Um, I was wondering, Brian, could you tell us a little bit about the visual approach to it and the use? So there's obviously quite a lot of dr drama in it and dramatized archive, and um, I just would like to hear a little bit from you about it, and then I will open up. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's, 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 you know, it's an amazing story, and, and when we started looking into it, we discovered that there was all this police footage, which, because it's Sweden, anybody can have it and use it, because the Swedes are very civilized about stuff like this, so, so we could get hold of this footage and use it, and, and, and you know, it's amazing, uh, and we thought that we'd have to supplement that with some, other, some of our own, you know, recreating some of the stories, so we identified... I don't know however many scenes there are. There are a couple of scenes that we did recreate that never made it into the film, but you know, key scenes like the cigar scene because it's just so ridiculous, and uh, and some of the others. So, and, you know, I'd like to claim that from day one there was a complete uh, vision for how the film would look, but there wasn't really. Uh, we knew we had we knew we had him. We knew we had great interviews. We knew we had Jenny, uh, and we knew we had the police archive and all the other archive and the stuff we'd recreate and then we just put it all together in a way that hopefully works. Yeah, it, it definitely works and you, ha you also had an actor that looks amazingly like him, I think. <laughs> it's like really, really, really shocking. Question here. And I, we have a roving mic. I think they want to capture the question. So we'll go here and then we'll go to, right to the back. Uh, fabulous film, Brian. Thank you. Uh, a couple of uh, questions. Is, I'm kind of curious about the darker side of him that was beyond the acquittals, because he clearly stabbed a guy 12 times, which would be an attempt murder, and, you know, and he was a, that seemed to be a part of the process that he was never challenged for that. It was just He was never convicted. And I'm sort of curious about well, that incident and the rest of... Are there other untruths that we don't know about in his... In, in his dark past, and also, how is he seen in Sweden now? 
Uh, well, if, if I may, I'll start off answering this and I'll hand over to Jenny. Uh, yeah, he did a lot of bad things, but people change. And, you know, the, the crimes that he committed, you know, the, the, you know, the groping of the boys and then the stabbing of the, of the man. Uh, yeah, they're terrible, terrible things that he did, but he did change, you know, I, I, I think. Uh, as regards to whether there are untruths in his life that we don't know about, I have no idea. I don't know. Uh, possibly, but I don't think he killed anyone. And as to how he's seen in Sweden, I'll let Jenny answer that. Well, as Brian said, uh, we are a very open country in Sweden. So today, Stuart Burwell is freed and he lives by himself in a small apartment in the northern part of, of Sweden. And he rides trains and he goes in the public and people recognize him, but they never harass him. Uh, anything like that. There are no paparazzis outside his place. <laughs> Uh, he is still a public figure, and he will always be. And surprisingly, he's writing his own book now. Uh, the commission <laughs> yesterday uh, said that it's been 17 books on the Thomas Quick case, um, and Stuart Burwell ha have been written three of them when his book is coming out. Um, so this has been a subject um, in the Swedish history for a long time. So I think that all of them, uh, most Swedes today agree that this was a gross miscarriage of justice. Except Johan Lamberts. <laughs> Quick, run. Um, I, I noticed you used a, a, a sort of blank screen background for some of the interviews, but not for others. Was that a deliberate, or was it just? Um, uh, was I mean, it, it, it seemed to be. Uh, I'd say, was it deliberate? Uh, we we did our initial round of interviews in a studio in Stockholm, and uh, we just decided to use that backdrop. And then we realised, I, I realised that we needed to do some more stuff, and it wasn't practical to go back to that studio in Stockholm at the time. So we just shot them where we where we could shoot them uh, so there's no no great design in that I'm afraid fair enough <laughs> did somebody say what, what what was what was the budget yeah. I had a productions here maybe she should answer it was I think it was uh, close to a million pounds About 850,000. Um, one of the most absorbing parts of the film was obviously the validation that he got from the interest of therapists. And I just wondered, did you worry about the interest that you were giving him as a filmmaker? Were you concerned that he would over-dramatise or that you'd replicate that relationship in the film? Yeah, I mean, I, there's clearly a, a Thomas Quick industry in Sweden and and I was becoming part of that, and in making that film, we were, you know, we were making our film and making money out of Thomas Quick. Uh, and I wondered how, you know, in terms of the relationship I had with him, and he wouldn't speak English, he can speak English, I think, quite well, but he, does, he wouldn't speak it to me. So it's difficult to pick up on nuances and, 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 and to really get to know him as well as I would like to have done. Uh, and of course, you know, I wondered whether at times he was being completely truthful with me or whether there was some kind of game or whether he was wanting to present an image of himself through, through the film that we were making. But Jenny was there all the time uh, with us and she, you know, Jenny and I would talk a lot afterwards about what he'd been saying and what, how it had come across. You know, because actually when we were interviewing him, uh, he'd reply in Swedish. He understood my questions in English and he'd reply in Swedish. And then I would say, what did he say, Jenny? <laughs> and of course, she'd just give me a quick pricey. Uh, and, and we had to wait till afterwards to get the real full you know, story of what he'd been saying. So yeah, it was a, it was a worry. But I, I think that's the same in, in any documentary, you know, whoever it is, you, people always want to present a certain image of themselves and, and you just have to live with that, that idea. Because I just told Jane, the co-producer, no, yes? Uh, we were talking about if this uh, movie, film is going to 
going up in the cinemas in Sweden, and I said, I really hope so, because Stuart Bergwald is very truthful in this interview, and uh, he talks about things that I do not think the Swedish audience have heard him talk about before. So. Okay. <clears throat> And just, just while we're waiting for the mic, I should add that when I met him and we agreed to do the film, I, I asked him if anything was off limits, uh, and he said, no, nothing is off limits, so ask me anything. Um, great film. I almost walked out halfway through, and I'm glad I didn't know. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't as well. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if there's been any repercussions for the psychiatrists who kind of led him up the garden path. Uh, well, again, I'll, I'll, I'll pass over to Jenny, but I, I don't think so. I think, I think they're all still working, but Jenny would know more. Yes, they are all still working, um, and there is still a small group of people, the people responsible for this story, that still believes that Stuart Bergwald committed all of these crimes. And we saw two of them in the movie, the Supreme Court judge, Jana Lambert and uh, crime reporter Gubjörn Stigson. Uh, so they are the forefronters of this small group of people uh, still believing. Um, the therapists ha have never spoken up in any Swedish media at all. She claims that she cannot speak because she has this patient uh, doctor privilege or therapist privilege. But uh, Stuart Bergwald has released her of all of these protection thing is you have <laughs> obligations you have. Uh, but she will never talk i don't think so uh, she's still working uh, she's not in the forensic psychiatric ward anymore but she's uh, private practice yeah I just wonder, um, he's in jail for 23 years. Has government given him some compensation for this 23 years? Uh, not, not jail, like uh, uh, it's kind of like holding in the room for the 23 years. Get compensation. Oh, compensation. Uh, Thank you. Well, again, I, I think he, I, the, the commission, the quick commission only reported yesterday. Uh, so I think uh, Stura and his lawyers are, are taking a view on whether now because they've been vindicated whether they will now apply for compensation. Uh, do you know more, Jenny? Um, yes, Stura has uh, sued the government or the Swedish state, uh, and he's still in that process. Uh, but we are not a country uh, with big payouts at all. Uh, so I, do, I don't think he will end up with anything. Actually, because also they argue that he confessed, so then he's kind of guilty. Can I remind you, please, to vote on your way out and can you say again a big thank you for this fantastic primary? Thank you.